In this episode of Scaling Postgres, we talk about shaped sample data, version changes, missed bottlenecks, and indexes for newbies. I'm Creston Jamison, and this is Scaling Postgres, episode 199. All right, I hope you, your friends, family, and coworkers continue to do well. Our first piece of content is how to shape sample data with PostgreSQL Generate Series and SQL. This is from timescale.com, and they're talking about a third in a series that they're doing about Generate Series. And this is about generating data that you can use for testing purposes without having to, say, have a copy of production data. This part focuses on potentially avoiding just a random function for generating data, but allowing you to generate all sorts of different types of, I'll call them waveforms. So for example, generating something that looks like that, using techniques like uh, sine waves and mathematical variations to get the type of waveform you are wanting to simulate. So I found this to be a very interesting post, and if you're wanting to generate more realistic data then definitely check out this blog post and find some techniques about how to do that. The next piece of content, configuration changes across PG versions. This is from depsc.com. And he's talking about his site, whyupgrade.depesc.com. And it's basically a site that allows you to put in two different Postgres versions, and it shows you what has changed between those versions. And it shows you things like parameters that have changed or default values that have changed for parameters. For example, when you put in 13.5 to 14.1, it shows you that two parameters were removed and are no longer there. There are 17 new parameters that you can configure, and three parameters have had their default values changed. So to me, this is a super useful tool. If you're ever wondering what's changed between versions, maybe try using this tool to help you get a better sense of it. The next piece of content, five easy to miss PostgreSQL query performance bottlenecks. This is from PowellUrbanek.com. And the first area he mentions is when you're searching by a function call, or basically you you have a query that's using a function. Well, that's not going to use any index that exists on it. You actually need to use a functional index. He says he's not really a fan of doing that, but there are some other ways you can do it other than just making a functional index. You could change all the data so to ensure that the database always just has lowercase data in it. You could do the functional index, but his solution is using the site text extension. Basically, that lets you create a column with a different data type of site text, a case insensitive text. So you would change the table data column to be that site text for email, and then when you do a search, it can use the index. The next bottleneck he mentioned is searching by a pattern. So using like or I like to try and find partial matches within a field. So in his example here, he looked at wanting to see all emails that end in at example.com. Now that's not going to use an index. And he has a particular technique he used with some extensions to be able to do that. Now, if you only wanted to look at the left anchored portion, so if your email addresses start with A, if you did A percent, you can do what is mentioned in the comment down here, use the uh, text pattern ops usage for that email address, and you can use the index for like or I like. But that won't work for a right anchored pattern, so it won't work in this case. But the technique he uses here does. Now he says adding the btree gen index, I don't know why he mentioned that. It's not needed because this works when you're wanting to combine a search on, say, an ID and a JSON field. So I did some tests and I was able to get it working without this. So I'm not quite sure why this is here. But you would need to add the trigram extension and then create a gen index using the gen trigram ops addition to the index. And once that is done, you can do a right anchored or even, I believe, a no anchored search within email, and it will use the index. The next bottleneck he mentions is ordering by nulls last, because if you don't have this in your index, it's not going to be able to use it. So you can tell this is doing a sequential scan once he adds nulls last as a part of it, because you don't want to bring up users who have null email addresses in, in the 10 limit that he's using here. Now you can add nulls last 
to the index. And he says that adding custom indexes on a per query basis is a bad practice. To me, it depends on performance. If this is a main core query that's going to be used a lot, it would make sense for it to be added because his alternative here is doing two queries. And these two queries could have worse performance than just adding another index. And plus it requires two round trips to the database to do the query, unless I of course, you're doing a union, for example. But it depends on the use case. I might want to add nulls last to the index. The fourth bottleneck, bloated null indexes. So this is the case where you have an, a column that's being indexed and it has a lot of null values in it. Now, generally, you probably don't want to do that and you'll probably want to use a partial index where the values are not null. And that'll just give you those core values. So you would end up with a much smaller index that should be able to be searched faster and use less space and also stay cached more frequently because the index is smaller. The last bottleneck he mentioned is update transaction scope. Now, I wasn't really sure what this title meant, but I think he's just talking about when you're doing a lot of changes, a lot of updates, a lot of deletes, it's important to batch those because you're going to be doing an awful lot of row locks, as he mentions here, row exclusive locks, which you can take. But whenever you're deleting or updating a lot of records, each of those has to be locked. So it's best to do that in a batch process. But if you want to learn more about these bottlenecks, you can check out this blog post. The next piece of content, Postgres indexes for newbies. This is from crunchydata.com, and this is an introductory post about some of the main indexes in Postgres. They talked about uh, B-tree indexes, which are your general index type, Brin index, which are block range indexes. So these are great for doing indexing over blocks of ranges. So this is good for date ranges or timestamp ranges. It's not as fast pulling out specific values, but for doing ranges, it can be a really good index for that use case. Talking about gist indexes, which are typically used for spatial type indexes, as well as some text searching. Although I tend to use gen indexes for that. And the gen indexes are useful when you have multiple values in a single column. So that could be text search, that could be JSON or JSONB fields. And the post goes over these different index types and how to use them. So if you want to learn more, you can check out this blog post. The next piece of content, waiting for PostgreSQL 15, introduced log destination equals JSON log. This is from depesc.com, and they have added JSON output. I'm not a huge fan of having the log output be JSON because a lot more has to be written for every record. So essentially, the column of the data will be written in every single record. So I'm not a huge fan of that. It'll probably take more space, but I can see how this becomes much easier to consume for monitoring applications. But if you want to learn more about this feature coming in Postgres 15, definitely check out this blog post. The next piece of content, surviving without a super user, part two. This is from arhas.blogspot.com. And this is a follow-up to the post where he's talking about potentially the need to have a type of user that is below a super user, but it actually has control over a fair amount of schemas and objects within a segment of the database. So this could be useful for service providers, where the service provider running the database on your behalf would have the super user access, but you could be granted this secondary set of permissions to be able to manage different objects under your purview. And he talked about some things we'll want to take into account, like allowing these special types of users to set up logical replication or allow them to set up event triggers or even some alter system commands. Not all of them, but a subset of them. So this blog post describes some of the things that would potentially need to be done to make this happen. Next piece of content, why I enjoy PostgreSQL, infrastructure engineer's pr perspective. This is from Shayon.dev, and he was talking about the difference between MySQL and PostgreSQL in terms of how infrastructure engineers actually prefer MySQL. I did not know that. But he's mentioning some things that he likes about PostgreSQL, and he's talking about uh, making schema changes and talking about how you can create an index or drop an index concurrently to avoid locking during that change. And he also mentions you can apply foreign key constraints without significant locking by using the not valid command. So you would add the constraint using not valid, and then at some point later, you could validate the constraint and allow that to run, and this would not be blocking. He also mentions being able to add not null or other constraints, 
or even a default value. Now, since Postgres 11, I believe, you can do this without locking. So I think this procedure would only be relevant for versions below 11 because you can add a not null and not have it do locking with versions 11 and later to my knowledge. And then the last area he covers is extensibility. So there's definitely tons of extensions that you can add to change the different features of Postgres. So if you're interested in learning more, you can check out this blog post. Next piece of content, PostgreSQL bidirectional replication using pglogical. This is from aws.amazon.com. They're talking about trying to get bidirectional replication going with pglogical, and they walk through the steps of how to do it and get it running. Now, the only way it is set up to handle conflicts is basically the last write wins. So even though this is doing some bidirectional replication, if there is a conflict, the last one to update basically wins. But if you want to learn more about how to do this, you can check out this blog post. The next piece of content, data normalization in PostgreSQL. This is from cybertech-postgresql.com. And they're talking about normalization in general and the first, second, third normal forms, as well as the voice cod normal forms. So if you're interested in learning more about normalization in Postgres in particular, definitely check out this blog post. The next piece of content, the PostgreSQL person of the week is Kuntal Ghosh. So if you're interested in learning more about Kuntal and his contributions to Postgres, definitely check out this blog post. And the last piece of content, we had another episode of the Rubber Duck Dev Show this past Wednesday. This episode was on the dark side of open source. Now, this is mostly focused on some Ruby and JavaScript libraries, but given Postgres is an open source project, you may find this particular content of interest. So this is a longer form developer-based discussion, but if you're interested in that, we encourage you to check out this blog post. That does it for this episode of Scaling Postgres. You can get links to all the content mentioned in the show notes. Be sure to head over to scalingpostgres.com where you can sign up to receive weekly notifications of each episode. Or you can subscribe via YouTube or iTunes. Thanks.